So um, I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, hemopoietic stem cell transplants and uh, tell you about some of the work that we've been doing over the last several years on this in uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, but first I thought I might uh, discuss what stem cells are uh, and then uh, tell you about transplanting them. So there, there are more than one type of stem cells, uh, which leads to a lot of confusion uh, among patients when we discuss this with them. But a stem cell is a cell that's capable of growing into other uh, types of tissues. Uh, so it's an early precursor of these cells that your body uses as a source to replace uh, tissues that are damaged or uh, to create a, a baby from an embryo. Uh, this is a picture of uh, embryonic stem cells, which are in the news a lot. Um, and just to show you how this works, uh, uh, when the egg is fertilized, it uh, uh, divides into cells. And at about day 8 to 10, uh, there are 32 cells that make up, uh, it's not even an embryo at this point, it's called a blastocyst. And those 32 cells are capable of growing into every single tissue in the body. Um, these are the embryonic stem cells, and, and that's uh, an area that has a lot of excitement in it uh, because we, if we can learn how to manipulate these and, and work with them, we could potentially replace any injured tissue in the entire body. Um, within about uh, two to four days after this, these stem cells have already changed so that they're committed only to one line, uh, and they're no longer able to grow into any tissue, but they're, they're, they're limited into what tissues that they can grow into. So uh, that, that's why they have to work with embryonics right now to figure out how to manipulate them. What we're working with is, is not these stem cells, but hemo, hemo, <laughs> hemopoietic uh, stem cells. Even I can't say it. Um, these are stem cells that we all have. Our blood uh, takes a lot of, uh, of abuse, uh, and we have to replace it. So our white cells are used up to fight off infection. Our red cells uh, get beaten up as they circulate around the, the body. Uh, we bleed out uh, from it. So you have to have a source to replace all this, and, uh, and that is the stem cells that we're working with. These. Uh, Stem cells live in the bone marrow, uh, and they're capable of growing into any uh, component of the blood and, and to replace that. Uh, so these are stem cells that are farther along than those embryonic stem cells, and these are only capable of growing into blood products. So what we do is we give uh, patients very high dose chemotherapy and basically kill off their immune system and then replace it. So uh, the first question is what happens when you do that and what is the immunology that results from it? Uh, do you really just change out a person's old immune system and plug in a new one? Uh, we actually give the stem cells back from the patient and the reason for that is that uh, you would think that you might want to give them someone else's immune system, but to do that has about a 30% death rate right now, and that's not acceptable. So we have to give them their own immune system back. But when we do that, it, it does not give them the exact same immune system. We believe it has to go through the process of deleting uh, immune reactivity to their own body, so deleting autoimmunity. It's like hitting the reboot button on your computer. So immediately after we give this high-dose chemotherapy, we pretty much drop all of their uh, blood counts to, to zero, uh, at least the white blood counts. So there are these short-term immediate effects, and then there's long-term changes, and we're most interested in the long-term changes that result. Short term, uh, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the platelets, uh, they recover within two to three weeks. So when I was in training, uh, we didn't have the modern uh, medicines that we give these patients to rev up their, uh, their stem cells, uh, and it would take several months for their 
white counts to come back up and they would be extremely ill because if you have no immune system for three months or so, uh, that, that's a problem. But uh, now we can get them back up and running within two to three weeks and that's greatly decreased the risk of infections. Uh, the lymphocyte count recovers within three months. Uh, but there are long-term changes in the lymphocyte subtypes that we think lead to uh, profound changes in the way the immune system behaves for many, many years following. So this is rather technical and you probably don't need to remember all these weird uh, abbreviations and stuff, but just to show you that there are a lot of changes. The, the natural killer cells are back up and running almost immediately. Uh, the B cells are back up and running within three months or so, uh, but there are the CD8 cells uh, which have recovered in three to six months, but they often overshoot. Uh, and then the CD4 cells have a prolonged loss. Uh, so there are these many, many changes going on within the immune system. Now I'll show you some of the slides. So this is natural killer cells. And these cells are capable of just outright killing a target. Uh, we use it a lot to fight off viral infections and things like that. So you can see after a transplant, they go to zero, uh, but within really a very short time, they're, they're back up to normal. Uh, th this dotted line is the upper limit of normal. So they're, uh, they initially overshoot, then they're back to normal. This is B cells. B cells are the ones that make antibodies. And, uh, uh, they drop to zero, uh, but then they recover over a few months and they even overshoot, so uh, they're even better than normal. These are CD8 cells, and uh, CD8, these are the white blood cells, the, the lymphocytes, and um, there are two main categories, the CD8 and CD4, uh, and CD8 cells are, um, the, the CD8 molecule on their surface allows them uh, when they um, identify a target to actually kill that target. Uh, if the target is a, um, a cell that's infected with a virus or something, it kills that cell. If the target is another lymphocyte, it kills it. So these are called suppressor T cells because they're able to suppress other components of the immune system by killing them off. Uh, and uh, you can see they drop to zero, uh, and then they recover, but it takes, it takes longer than it did the previous two sets of cells. Uh, but then they, they continue reasonably normal after, you know, after the first few months. CD4 cells are, you know, the other family of the uh, lymphocytes. And these, uh, the CD4 molecule, uh, when they latch onto a target, it doesn't kill the target, it actually turns the target on. So um, these uh, cells are the ones that we call them helper cells because it actually helps the rest of the immune system rev up. In autoimmune diseases, we generally think of these as the bad guys. And you can see they drop to zero and then they, they never really recover even after several years. So what we've really done with a stem cell transplant like this is shift that ratio of suppressors to helpers uh, much more in favor of suppressors uh, and away from the helper cells. So we generally uh, decrease the uh, autoimmunity uh, that's going on. We're able to do that while leaving most of the rest of the immune system intact, like those B cells and natural killers and stuff. So, uh, so the patient after they get through the initial uh, phase of this, the initial two to three weeks is really at very small risk of having uh, infections occur at a later date. There's many ways to, to inflict damage on the immune system, and these are just some of the ones that are fairly commonly used in, uh, in multiple sclerosis. And I, I won't go over these in detail, but just to to say that in some ways they all have a, a similar uh, goal, which is just to beat up the immune system. And the question is, how hard are we going to beat it up? So uh, with the stem cell transplants, it's sort of the ultimate uh, in beating them up. It's probably the most aggressive treatment that we have out there. Well, how successful is it? Uh, there are several uh, studies that have been done, but there's, uh, there's about three that are of su sufficient size to, to really make much out of. This is our study, uh, and uh, 
Richard Nash, who's the lead author on this, is at the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. Uh, the Hutch, uh, as it's called locally, has done about two-thirds of the uh, stem cell transplants in the world uh, for patients that are getting their own bone marrow back. Um, so we studied 26 patients, and the mean EDSS is a seven. And this is a disability scale, and a seven means you're wheelchair bound. So these patients are quite uh, advanced in their, in their MS. We only had one relapsing remitting patient, and the rest were either primary or secondary progressive. Uh, so this is a very difficult group to treat uh, historically. Um, they also had had very active disease, so they had to have dropped a point on this EDSS scale in the last 12 months, which is very rapid decline. So we were really taking the worst of the worst cases to enroll in this study. And you can see that uh, we, uh, you would expect virtually all of these patients to continue to get worse. And uh, it, it, uh, the, the survival or, or the, um, uh, the number that remained stable uh, was uh, about 70%. Uh, and then the survival of the patients, uh, we had a very low death rate. There was only one uh, death rate that uh, occurred that uh, was unfortunate that we think would not happen now, but uh, you know we didn't know at the time. Uh, we, um, after we transplant them, we give them ATG, which is anti-thymocyte globulin, and we get that from horse serum. And this one patient was allergic to horses, so we gave the rabbit version of it. And, um, and uh, 56 days later, she got a fatal virus infection. Well, it turns out that there were nine cases. This was the only MS case, but there were eight other people with other diseases that the exact same thing happened to. And it turns out that the rabbit ATG was tenfold uh, more powerful than, than uh, the manufacturer realized. So uh, when they corrected that, uh, you know, that calibration error, then uh, that problem has been eliminated. So it does have a high risk, but um, uh, we think the risk, uh, we're getting a good handle on how to minimize that. Uh, this is the series from Northwestern in Chicago. Uh, they had 21 patients. Their mean EDSS is 6.3. A 6 means that you need uh, one cane. A 6.5 is two canes or a walker. 7 is a wheelchair. Um, and uh, they also had one re relapsing remitting case. Uh, they looked at it uh, with people that had uh, an EDSS of less than six, uh, or less than or equal, so it's as one cane or better, versus the rest of uh, people that were worse than that. And uh, the people that had a, a low level of disability basically remained stable, and the ones with a higher level of disability uh, continued to worsen, suggesting that uh, if this is going to work, it works better early than waiting late. Uh, this is the European uh, study, and there are several sites in Europe that have done this, but they uh, collected them all together uh, for this study, and there's a total of 85 throughout Europe. And uh, their mean EDSS was 6.5, so a, a walker uh, or two canes. Uh, and uh, again, uh, only 4% were relapsing, remitting. Uh, and, uh, you know, they also showed a positive uh, effect. Uh, this is our latest data, and we, uh, over the last year, have brought all these patients uh, back, and uh, we've now followed them out up to six years, uh, which is really the longest follow-up that, uh, that is out there. And uh, it looks like um, the, uh, th this graph is the patients that had uh, subsequent uh, worsening of their disability. And it looks like um, uh, about 38% of them have had another or had a worsening uh, within the, the six-year period. So 62% of them are stable, which is fairly remarkable considering how bad these cases were when they went into the study. So, the summary of the data that we have now is that by three years, three quarters to 80% of patients are stable. By six years, 62, 63% are stable. 
we think that perhaps it's more effective early in disease and perhaps more effective in relapsing remitting uh, because that's an earlier form of the disease really. Um, and the overall death rate of all of the, the patients that have been done worldwide is 7%. But we believe that uh, since about 2000, the year 2000, uh, that uh, we've got a handle on the complications so that the uh, fatality rate would be about 3%, um, 3 to 4, or something like that. So, uh, you know, one question is why? <clears throat> Why is this not 100% successful? You know, I mean, if we're changing out patients' immune system, uh, that ought to fix it, but it didn't completely fix it. So one reason may be that uh, MS is not entirely autoimmune, and there may be some components that are not, and we're not able to address those with the immune transplant. Uh, or amazingly enough, it may be that we're not immune suppressive enough and that we need to kill off even more of the immune system, but how to do that. And then uh, the uh, third possibility is that we may just be getting in there too late because so many of these patients are progressive forms of MS and they're also at high levels of disability. And it may be that so much damage has occurred that the brain just cannot maintain itself uh, even when the immune system is taken out of the mix. This is a, a slide of oligoclonal bands, and this is the spinal tap that people get for MS. And we run a gel uh, to look at the uh, immunoglobin proteins. And um, you can see on this left panel, if, if you're angled right to the screen, that there are these dark bands across there. These are oligoclonal bands, and each of those bands is a clone of B cells within the central nervous system <clears throat> that is uh, making antibodies. And uh, this is the before, and this is the after. And you can see uh, that uh, these bands, uh, I put arrows there so you could see them more easily. It's the exact same bands before and after. So despite a bone marrow transplant, uh, we are not affecting the B cells that are making antibodies. And this may be one reason we're not 100% effective. Uh, we have 19 patients that we have before and after uh, samples on. 17 of those had the exact same uh, bands before and after. Two of them had no bands before, but had bands after. Uh, so um, we're, we're not affecting the B cells. There was a, um, a conference, uh, an NIH conference a couple of years ago, and I, uh, I wish I remembered which immunologist was, uh, made this statement so I could credit him, but he said that the memory B cells are the cockroaches of the immune system because you can't kill them no matter what. Another reason uh, that we uh, may not be successful, uh, uh, completely successful, is that uh, the inflammation uh, may be uh, of a nature that we can't really get to. And this uh, is a slide that I showed on my earlier talk on uh, Thursday. And uh, it shows that there's actual demyelination of the cortex, and shown in the orange on the right. This uh, inflammation is actually very low grade, and it's so low grade that the blood-brain barrier is intact, uh, which is why it doesn't show up on uh, many of our forms of MRI. Um, but it's really hard to get our treatments in there because a lot of the treatments don't get into the brain unless the blood-brain barrier is damaged as well. So it may be that um, there are pockets of inflammation that we're not completely reaching. So how to deal with these B cells and pockets of inflammation that we can't really get to? One, the only known way to do that is something called an allogeneic transplant where you put someone else's bone marrow into the patient. And, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that uh, has a high mortality rate. Um, the reason that that is successful, though, is that the other person's bone marrow, when you put it into the patient, uh, if, uh, they never 100% match up. So the two uh, immune systems fight with each other for dominance. 
And since the patient's original bone marrow got beaten up with all this chemotherapy, the transplant eventually wins out. It's called a graft versus host disease, and uh, that uh, is the only mechanism that we know of that will completely change out a person's immune system, though it takes about nine months for it to um, invade every little nook and cranny and, and um, you know, kill off the, the native bone marrow. And, and that's what I just uh, mentioned, but the problem is it's a high mortality. There are ways now that are being developed that we believe will drop the uh, mortality of this to 5%. So it's getting close to the range of what uh, is uh, potentially something we could think of, though we would like to minimize the uh, risk even further. So um, looking at these allogeneic transplants from someone else into the patient, uh, there is a way to look at that, and that's that there are people out there who probably need to have a good talk with their spiritual advisor about why their luck is so bad, but they have both MS and cancer and end up getting transplanted for that reason. And um, we uh, actually have access through the Fred Hutch to the uh, databases both here and in Europe. And um, uh, we were able to identify about 14 patients that had such bad luck. And uh, of these 10 were in the States and we were able to bring them here to Seattle and, um, and evaluate them. Uh, we actually are evaluating the cases in Europe, but we bring them into European centers for their evaluation, and uh, it's much slower um, to, uh, you know, to get that done. Anyway, we looked at 10 of these patients. Uh, they're anywhere from six months to 144 months, so that's like, you know, like 13, 14 years. Uh, and in that time, seven were stable, two had gotten worse, and one was not evaluated. Uh, of the ones with algoclonal bands, six no longer had bands. We, we don't have the spinal fluid before because this was not really an experiment where you control what data you get. Uh, but um, we would expect algoclonal bands to be present in 90% of patients with MS. So having six of the um, eight that this, the specimens were run on to be negative suggests that this really was successful at killing off those B cells. We're also uh, doing more studies on uh, transplanting patients getting their own bone marrow back. And um, this study has been going for a little bit over a year now. It's called the HALT MS study. And here's all the letters if you want to know how we got HALT out of that. Um, and uh, what we're looking for is 25 patients. And we're trying to answer a couple of questions. One. Uh, we want to get around the question of did we transplant them too late in their disease course. So we're looking only at relapsing remitting and people with EDSSs of 5.5 or less. So 5.5 they would not need a cane, uh, though they would have limitations on their walking. And then you don't want to do this on just any patient because it does have some risk. So we wanted patients that had a very bad prognosis and therefore had patients that had active disease. So we're requiring that they have two attacks in the last 18 months and that those attacks be so bad that it has dropped them by more than a point on the EDSS. And we're uh, giving them a beam uh, which is a four chemotherapy regimen. Uh, the, the previous one, uh, most of those previous studies, they got uh, one chemotherapy drug plus radiation. With this one, it's four drugs, no radiation. Uh, and uh, then our plan is to follow them for five years. Um, associated with this study, we're doing a lot, the NIH is doing a lot of studies on the immune cells to see what cells are recovering uh, in what order they're recovering in so that if patients succeed or if they fail on this treatment, we will have a better handle on uh, was their immune uh, explanation for that. So in conclusion, uh, we think that this extremely high dose immunosuppression may slow MS, especially in aggressive cases. We've reduced the morbidity to less than 5%. Um, and uh, we suspect that 
completely eliminating the immune system may be more effective, but the, uh, the data is still very preliminary on that, and we will need to work out uh, you know, more um, mechanisms to minimize the mortality because it's still unacceptably high. Uh, but we hope that the studies that are ongoing are going to answer at least some of these questions over the next few years so that we know uh, how well this works and if so, what the best patient group is. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>